this se session on nuclear weapons, so I thought I would make a couple of comments on nuclear weapons. Especially the last question. So if you make a change, it's not just that 10 years later you may have second thoughts. But in this case, some senator, uh, congressperson, uh, Secretary of Defense, President may come in and say, persuade me that this really works. When was it tested? And the answer is not tested, we're just sure it works. So even though you're sure, even though the scientific community in the uh, business may stand behind it, you know, it's the least uh, able person uh, that you have to persuade. And what's the, what's the fear? The fear is that you will insist, insist on testing, which will reduce our nuclear weapon capability because testing is very expensive, underground testing. And it will lead to other people testing, which will improve their nuclear weapons and lead to proliferation. So that's the problem. So here's my talk about, uh, oh, that's, the, that's the wrong one. But I'll do this one first. <laughs> So this, this will be, so I, we thought we should have a little bit about uh, missile defense. And so you can read the uh, large print, I will, and I'll sit down actually. So with the advent of new US Space Force and uh, new staff in various national security and policy positions in the government, the options for space-based defense against ballistic missiles are once again under consideration. So the first round of such advocacy under in human memory, including mine, was with the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative in 1983, launched by President Reagan with his television speech on March 23rd. But that space-based uh, defense aimed to protect the United States against all of the then 6,000 strong Soviet nuclear-armed ICBM and submarine-launched ballistic missile warheads. Instead, what we have now, after hundreds of billions of dollars of expenditure in the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization and its successors, now the Missile Defense Agency, we have 44 uh, ground-based interceptors, which can handle not 44 weapons uh, in sp uh, launched through space, but maybe 22 or 9, because they have to Imagine launching a large number of them. They're not very re reliable if their reliability is not, in fact, zero for killing the warheads for a reason I will mention. These aren't even de deployed against Russian uh, nuclear weapons or Chinese nuclear weapons. We are assured by successive governments. They're deployed against rogue nations, of which there are now only two officially, North Korea, which does have nuclear weapons and does have ICBM range capable missiles, and Iran, which doesn't have either. And in fact, we have, in my opinion, quite a good agreement with Iran, limiting their de development of nuclear weapons and of nuclear weapon fuel that this administration has, to my mind, unfortunately, uh, abandoned. So th this document will be posted on the website. I'll go back to the, well, let's see, I can even go this way. Yeah, I can. And so uh, over here is the site, the so-called Darwin Archive, and you can search it by doing site colon fas.org slash rlg, quote, quote neutral particle for looking for neutral particle beams, for instance which I mentioned here. So we recently had a 2019 Missile Defense Review, uh, which uh, follows a strategic posture review and other things. It was published in Janu January 18th by the Department of Defense. And you can read the executive summary online. So here I discuss the proposal to emphasize space-based weapons against offensive ballistic and cruise missiles, both strategic and shorter range as indicated in this quotation, which I'm not going to read. But uh, they do talk about including space-based sensors and boost phase defense capabilities, calls for a missile defense architecture 
that can adapt to emerging and unanticipated threats, including by adding capacity and the capability to surge missile defense as necessary. Traditionally and logically, one can interfere with the delivery of nuclear explosive by ballistic or long-range cruise missiles during the interval of launch when the rocket uh, from a high thrust, when the uh, thrust from a high thrust rocket is operating, the boost phase intercept, BPI, or while the warhead is freely falling through the vacuum of space, mid-course intercept, or while the warhead is in its re-entry vehicle, penetrating the one kilogram per square centimeter mass density of the Earth's atmosphere, you know, the well-known 30, 30 some feet of water equivalent that shields us from cosmic rays and a lot of other bad things, including nuclear warheads without re-entry vehicles. On its way to explode within lethal range of its intended target of the, uh, on the surface. So these have the well-known benefits and deficiencies. I go into here, boost phase intercept, very visible, very vulnerable, uh, but it's you know, far away and only lasts for four minutes or so. Mid-course intercept takes 30 minutes or so. Uh, maybe you can see the, uh, the warhead falling through space via high-power radars. Uh, but countermeasures are simple in principle, and uh, particularly anti-simulation. So if you put the real warheads in a balloon, inflated balloon pioneered by NASA in the 1960 era, and have a number of similar balloons. They don't have to be identical. In fact, it's better if there's a whole range. That's called anti-simulation, and the defense has to target each of those with our current concept of hit-to-kill uh, vehicles. And so that's the problem with mid-course intercept, and it's so bad that we do not have a credible means of discriminating even ordinary uh, decoys against these real warheads. And finally, terminal intercept. All of the decoys are stripped away, and only the uh, warheads themselves are coming within lethal range of your target, which, if it's a city, unfortunately, is very big. And so you have to defend square, square miles of area, and you have to do it in the short time of, of the terminal uh, descent. And that means for these road states, which can't count on destroying the United States retaliatory force, that you have to defend every place because they can attack the places that are undefended. And so one ballistic missile in Iran means that you're going to have terminal interceptors in every city in the United States if we believe that Iran, if they can get and want to use ICBMs and nuclear weapons, uh, will make the little extra effort to have credible anti-simulation and decoys. So the Missile Defense Review is a highly aspirational document. It doesn't see any negatives to missile defense, only benefits in reducing the threat, deterring launch, reassuring allies, and the like. But Steve Fetter said that uh, Putin has all these brand new weapons. And why? Well, his excuse, anyhow, is our missile defense. And he thinks that we could put offensive uh, weapons into silos in Europe, which are nominally for defensive weapons, the uh, Aegis ashore for defending against rogue state striking Europe, striking our friends in Europe, if we have any friends left in Europe. Some of the enthusiasm, enthusiasm for space weapons arises from ignorance and the uh, victory of hope over experience. In this, I point, out, I point to the excellent report by the American Physical Society on boost phase intercept, and that's uh, footnote seven here at the bottom. It was done in uh, 2005, or published in 2005, with a star-studded cast. You can read it in the Reviews of Modern Physics online. Beginning in 1999, though, I advocated vigorously the development and deployment of a system for boost phase intercept against ICBMs launched from North Korea. Why North Korea? 
Well, because I just been on uh, the commission for uh, the uh, for assessing the threat to the United States from uh, nuclear armed ballistic missiles, the Rumsfeld Commission, and it said North Korea could have uh, ballistic missiles within 15 years, maybe even five years, with enough help from outside. And North Korea has only 120,000 square kilometers of area, and so you can get close enough to the launch point that you can intercept with a ground-based interceptor the uh, thrusting ballistic missile in the 250 seconds or so, four minutes of powered flight. So it would destroy the second stage booster while still in powered flight and highly visible and vulnerable to ground or sea-based interceptor stationed nearby. More recently, I paid more attention to the prospects of air-launched uh, boost space interceptors that proposed by Dean Wilkening in 2004. He was a participant in, in, the, in the APS study. Ted Postel and I have posted in 2017 and 18 two technical papers and have circulated more recently another one that identifies the General Atomic MQ-9 Reaper drone that's been in service for the last 10 years or so in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere, many of which are in service with US forces observing in conflict theaters to carry air-launched interceptors for destroying boosters within view of the launching aircraft. So here's a cartoon and uh, typical orbit of the airborne boost space uh, intercept drone aircraft to be uh, resident 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with two interceptors present on each for each ICBM in the North Korean inventory. So down here, the intercept launch point is a rather weak bed. Anyhow, down there, I, I, I can. Here, here's a uh, down there. Okay. So here, North Korea, Northwest North Korea launches. And here are uh, ticks, time ticks, at uh, five seconds each or 10 seconds each. Is the request that you make the microphone a little closer? I can't make it closer, but I can maybe make it louder. It's up here. Where is the microphone? I'll hold it. It may be. I'll hold it. Okay, so here are the time ticks on the uh, ballistic missile being launched. Here's burnout and uh, location shown at 60 second intervals afterwards on its way to its target. And here is the interceptor launched from 30,000 feet or so. And time ticks for it, 100 seconds, 140 seconds. 150 seconds, and it collides with the uh, ICBM in, in, in thrusting flight at 240 seconds after launch. Back was going to Washington. Here is a uh, sketch of the drone, the MQ-9 Reaper. It's got a 79-foot uh, wingspan, big wing, 24 meters, and here are two interceptors shown that carried underwing externally. And here's a comparison of Dean Wilkening's table from 2004, airborne interceptor design. And so uh, his were the baseline EXO, so it uh, collides with the, with the uh, target outside the atmosphere, <clears throat> so can't do aerodynamic maneuvering, but has to have side thrusters or rapid reorientation and axial thrusters. And here was his view of the advanced technology. But here's uh, our analysis of the, uh, of the current technology, so that the uh, airborne intercept mass is 285 kilograms whereas it was 1,500 kilograms in 2004. So you can carry more of them and uh, read the paper. So, 
So you can readily track from the aircraft itself because the missile is above the horizon and very bright. And all you need to do is to know the approximate region of the uh, thrusting missile. And then the interceptor itself has uh, infrared homing because this could be happening at night. If you're talking about space weapons, their orbits are predictable and uh, the ICBMs could be fired when no directed energy weapon, if that's what you have in space, was in range. So what's always limited my enthusiasm for space weapons is that they are highly visible and especially in low Earth orbit, LEO can be shot down at far less cost than required to maintain such a constellation. Naturally, the supporters say we'll use very small space weapons, but they still cost a lot and much more than uh, it costs, for instance, uh, to deploy tiny ground-based interceptors that don't, that don't have to go into orbit. Uh, but uh, but uh, can be launched to altitude. Suppose that the, you want to launch them to destroy a space weapon that's orbiting at 250 kilometers, for instance, then your booster from the ground only needs to get up to 250 kilometers. And if you give it a reach out range of 400 kilometers, it needs a velocity gain of three kilometers per second instead of the eight kilometers per second required for uh, entering orbit. And that's a factor three reduction in the booster mass and a lot easier. Furthermore, you can just launch a ton of sand uh, to altitude with an apogee of the 200 or 250 kilometers. And if you, if you figure you know, the effect of gravity, it'll hang there you know, for 10 seconds. It falls 125 meters in, in five seconds. So falling up 62 meters and down 62 meters is, takes 10 seconds. So the hang time of uh, 10 seconds. So all these space weapons are very vulnerable and they have to de be deployed in large constellations. So uh, another option is the development by the adversary, for instance, Russia or China, of space mines, which unlike naval mines, do don't just sit in the water, but they can't sit in, the sit in space, they have to move, so that you have centrifugal force to counter the gravity, crudely speaking. So they're in orbit, Know, following or preceding by a kilometer or half a kilometer the space weapon that they want to destroy on demand. And so they'd be ready to destroy their quarry. And so we published long ago in 2004 a paper describing the, the U.S. crossing the Rubicon of, uh, of putting weapons into space, which we're against. So. That's my story about uh, missile defense. The uh, existing ground-based interceptors, of which we have 44, uh, won't really work against a dedicated adversary capable of making ICBM range uh, missiles and nuclear weapons because it's a lot easier to do anti-simulation and countermeasures than it is to do that, and they are highly motivated not only to accomplish the uh, countermeasures and anti-simulation, but to keep them secret, to devise them that can be tested, not in space, but in a, an evacuated capsule that's falling down a mine shaft you know, on a bungee cord, essentially, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, compressing air at the bottom so that you can reuse the, the elevator laboratory. And uh, so you want, uh, countermeasures that deploy in a second rather than in a hundred seconds, A, to minimize the observation that the defense can make of them when they're actually deployed in warfare in space, and uh, B, so that you don't have to have a very deep mine uh, because they are deployed. And there were posted uh, countermeasures for U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, a, a replica inflated decoy for the Minuteman III warhead that you could see inflate 
uh, in real time in less than a second. I think that's been taken down, but it's been preserved by ma many people, including our adversaries. And of course, the replica decoy has to look exactly like the Minuteman it, uh, to radar and to infrared and maybe even to visible sensors. Whereas anti-simulation says, if you want to preserve the life of a king, you don't have a hundred decoys that is commoners dressed like uh, kings in ermine and with uh, Rolls Royce vehicles and you know, so that they all look the same. No, you dress the king as a commoner, it's a lot cheaper. And in space, you put the king in a, the warhead in a spherical inflated balloon and uh, have a whole bunch of them, which are the, the decoys, a lot easier because of anti-simulation. So I'll stop there and answer questions. Thank you. I will give a t second talk about Sidrell. But I I'll answer questions about nuclear weapons and uh, missile defense now. Yes, please. What the last words are what? So what, what, would, uh, what would be the effect on Russia's nuclear missile development if we were to create um, the in between the missile that we have right If we had enough interceptors uh, to counter the Russian force. No, no, I think she's asking about the boost phase interceptor. Oh, yeah. well, boost phase intercept. Yeah. Okay, well, in here I do have a few lines, and I say that because of the size of, of China and Russia. Uh, Russia, of course, has very many, you know, 1,500 and more uh, strategic uh, nuclear weapons, and China has maybe only 100. Uh, but uh, so we have plenty of weapons to destroy the Chinese weapons, but boost phase interceptors couldn't get there in boost phase, and they're useless uh, against non boost phase, against non boosting missiles. So they should ignore them. Yeah, the uh, question is whether the Russians might improve their nuclear arsenal because we deploy boost phase intercept. Well, that would be irrational. <laughs> it's very hard to make an argument. Uh, you, can, you can say A, then B, but that doesn't mean that there's any logic behind it. And, they're limited, and I would like them to do that. Why, don't, why shouldn't they waste their money? And Russia's a big nuclear power. And that's what I used to say about uh, when, when I talked to Casper Weinberger uh, at a session at the uh, U.S. military uh, facility, uh, War College in Washington. We had lunch together, and he was complaining that the Russians had, when he was secretary, he was secretary of defense, that the Russians had all of these new missiles, and we only had the Minuteman for our land-based missile. I said, good, you know, it'd be worse if the Russians chose the best of their many types of missiles and made them. <laughs> so, yes, I could tolerate that. And of course, you know, I, I write this for Russians as well as for Chinese. And in 1999, when I wanted to develop <clears throat> preemptively boost phase intercept against North Korean ICBMs, uh, I was proposing in that paper that I gave at the Huntsville, Ar uh, Huntsville Arsenal, uh, proposing to have the Russians deploy some of these interceptors on the little bit of land north, that abuts North Korea. It would be an ideal place. And that would, as uh, with their launch of the Sputnik satellite in 1957, that legitimized satellite overflight over other countries, namely the United States, and enabled us with some confidence in 1960 to launch the uh, photo reconnaissance satellite Corona for observing activities in the Soviet Union. So I'd be happy to have the Russians share this technology. So anyhow, now I want to talk about 
So can you find me uh, my talk about Sidrell? Sidre It's right here, isn't okay, it? Okay, I don't know. No, um, it's a, it's a, it's a. Yeah. Uh, oh, of, here we go. Yeah. Sidrells. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, and. Uh, yeah. If you, you can. So, can you hear me in the back now? Yeah. Okay. Good. So. Uh, Anyhow, here, here's, uh, I, I knew Sidrell very well. We worked together for years, and that's what I talk about here. He was born in 1926 and died December 2016. I knew him for many years and shared some of his activities in the pursuit of strategic stability and control of nuclear weapons. He did many other things in, in physics, theoretical physics, mentoring, uh, all kinds of music. Uh, I focus on three examples, any one of which should have earned him the world's deep respect and gratitude. So first, satellite imagery. I was to know Sid well through many days and weeks spent together on the President's Science Advisory Committee, PSAC, of which he was a member from 1966 to 1971 and particularly from some of its, of its military-oriented and intelligence panels. His first contact with the field was probably his service in the solution of a technical problem exhibited by the world's first film return satellite reconnaissance system, codenamed Corona, that first flew in August 1960 and last in 1972, returning to Earth a reentry vehicle, an RV, containing kilometers of ultra-thin base, high-resolution imagery taken by two panoramic drum cameras uh, in the satellite, each image occupying seven centimeters by about 76 centimeters length on the film, corresponding typically to 10 by 120 miles on the ground. So it had a resolution on the order of, of two meters. Uh, you know, not good these days, but wonderful in those days resulting in stereo coverage of a 120-mile wide ground swath. In 1963, Sid was asked by Bud Whelan, who was responsible for the Corona program and uh, also the Mach 3 uh, 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 aircraft program, uh, to head a small group of physicists to solve an urgent, even catastrophic problem, the fogging of the film by flame-like exposure to the electrical phenomenon known as corona, in this case arising from static electricity discharge of the highly insulating film as it, it was unspooled and transported over a complex path within the satellite in the vacuum of space, but you know, a bad vacuum because you're unlo un unrolling film <laughs> uh, in that vacuum. This was brought under control and was Sid's introduction to the highly classified and compartmented field of satellite reconnaissance. Sid took leave from Stanford, actually, to work on this problem for a couple of months. Sid then became a member of the Land Panel, <coughs> advisory to the President's Science Advisor at critical periods in the development of advanced satellite reconnaissance, especially imagery as distinguished from the return of electronic intelligence, ELINT, from space. Uh, the work of the LAND panel is described in some extent to my, in my 1995 paper on the Corona satellite program and in my remarks on the contribution of Edwin H. LAND himself. He was the inventor of uh, polarizing film for sunglasses and instant photography uh, Polaroid Corporation. Sid's work on satellite reconnaissance contributed greatly to U.S. knowledge of what was going on in the world in denied areas and earned him the formal designation as one of only 10 founders of National Reconnaissance, awarded in the year 2000 by the National Reconnaissance Organization, NRO, <clears throat> on the 40th anniversary of its formation. Sid's warm personality, persistence, and friendship enabled him to achieve many successes. 
On PSAC, he served for many years as a member of the Strategic Military Panel, SMP. Like most PSAC panels, the uh, mil Strategic Military Panel met for two days, about once a month, in the old Executive Office Building west of the White House. The SMP was concerned routinely with Soviet nuclear capabilities against the United States, ICBMs and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Soviet bombers were handled by my PSAC military aircraft panel and with defenses against those threats. Each year, the strategic panel would provide for the uh, president a highly classified technical assessment of the strategic confrontation part of which was usually an analysis of most recent proposals by the U.S. Army for deployment of missile defense against Soviet ICBMs and SLBMs. One such, signed by Sid as chair of the strategic panel, found its way to the desk of Henry Kissinger, President Nixon's nat national security advisor. And the now declassified document bears the note of Kissinger to his staff, we must get PSAC out of strategy. In fact, PSAC was not doing strategy, but looking at options and consequences. So Sid, as informal advisor to Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor and then Secretary of State, 1969 to 1975. Paul Doty, Harvard biochemist and close friend of Kissinger on the Harvard faculty, had long been interested and active in the control of nuclear weapons particularly in the Pugwash movement, which he took, where he took the initiative to have side meetings of some of the U.S. delegation to the international Pugwash meetings with Soviet scientists. The smart and public spirited, uh, Doty and his Harvard colleagues built these meetings into an important channel of communication with Soviet scientists and ultimately nuclear weapon developers, facilitated on the Soviet side by minders who duly reported to the highest levels of the Soviet government. So it was good to have the minders. On the US side, the Doty group would have preliminary meetings with the National Security Advisor, the uh, Secretary of State, and sometimes the Se Secretary of Defense, and would provide written and oral reports on the discussions. Sid was not a member of that group, but he was of another Doty group. The Nixon White House staff was suspicious of PSAC and did not have close relations. Could somebody bring me some water from back there? <laughs> Thank you. With, uh, did, did not have close relations with the PSAC chair, the president's science advisor. Doty, a founder of PSAC, realized that Kissinger was denying himself and the president valuable information and advice and arranged to have a side meeting the evening of the first day of each of the monthly two-day PSAC meetings with Kissinger, <clears throat> and again breakfast in the White House Situation Room the second day of the meeting. A small group of colleagues met with Kissinger, the Doty group, and uh, presented often highly classified papers that had been assigned uh, by Kissinger the previous month and accepted new tasks for the following month. Thank you. Two hands, two glasses, very good. <clears throat> Some of these had to do with the problem of MIRV, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles, others with limitations on missile defense, and the like. In particular, Sid and I were members of the land panel and were involved with an analysis of the options for successors to Corona in space imagery. Initially, there were two film return systems, Hexagon and Gambit, and then an option for the system that would return imagery by electronic transmission, more or less what's used uh, to the present day. <clears throat> Although we couldn't share this information with the rest of the Doty group at the time, Sid and I regarded it as our obligation to share it with the National Security Advisor, and after being empowered to do so, uh, we hand wrote a brief note and asked Kissinger's aide to take it to him when he was involved in a meeting. Kissinger and Nixon approved the system, which, was greatly, which has greatly contributed 
to U.S. knowledge of activities regarding strategic weapons, both offensive and defensive, as well as many other military and non-military bits of intelligence. Before his service on PSAC and its various panels in, in 1990, Sid was a, 1960, Sid was a founding member of the Jason Group of scientists advising elements of the U.S. government. Jason's first summer study was housed at Bodoon College and was focused on space and missile defense. It was the group's introduction to the phenomenology of nuclear explosions in space. As a member of various PSAC panels, I briefed Jason that summer, 1960. In 1966, I was invited to join Jason and had the pleasure of working with Sid in the summer studies, six weeks to eight weeks long, in La Jolla for the most recent 40 years or so. Before that, sometimes in uh, Woods Hole or Falmouth or Boulder or wherever. Jason itself was created by senior U.S. scientists, mostly physicists, who had been involved in the development of World War II, radar and particularly nuclear weapons. Most of them had experience with PSAC and recognized that there was a gap opening in the scientific expertise applied to military activities that had been essential in surviving and winning World War II. Ultimately, Charles Towns, in a stint as vice president of the Institute for Defense Analyses, together with the Jason founders, Marvin Goldberger, uh, Ken Watson, Keith Bruckner, uh, recruited their colleagues into what became the current Jason model, which has expanded much beyond physicists to uh, biologists, uh, mathematicians, chemists, computer scientists, and the like. There's a lot of fun in learning new things, as you know, and one of the results of the early study, in addition to consideration of blackout or redout <clears throat> as a result of space nuclear explosions, blackout from the electrons uh, from the fission products in the upper atmosphere and redout uh, from the large amounts of infrared, also from the radiation of the upper atmosphere was the Alphane propulsion engine. Sid delighted in calling it the ape in space. Alphane propulsion engine initials. Of course, there were serious matters and th these were taken as such. Jason was to provide what was missing from high level advisory committees in the government, fresh eyes on the important problems backed up by a weeks long scientific paper rather than by hunches and assertions. At a time when the Air Force was tiring of the same old Minuteman missile in silos in the United States, defense intellectuals were prescribing essential modifications of the basing, especially of a new missile, the MX, with X designating experimental. It was well known that the solution was the MX missile, but what was the problem? The problem was widely asserted by Paul Nitze and uh, those urging the deployment of the MX, uh, it was Minuteman, vulner Minuteman vulnerability <coughs> because Soviet warheads were assumed soon to be so accurate that they could destroy with high confidence a Minuteman silo with the expenditure of a single warhead from a highly merved 10 warhead Soviet missile. <coughs> I reviewed it later. And uh, Minuteman each was uh, carrying three warheads. And so this was a terrible instability. With one warhead, the Soviets could destroy three warheads. The MX missile basing insanity was rampant in 1980 with various high level official and unofficial panels advocating or criticizing various deployment options, including week long patrols of diesel powered aircraft over the United States carrying one or more MX missiles for air launch, these offensive missiles, but they couldn't be targeted because they weren't in fixed positions on the ground. Or they could be buried with uh, in, in racetrack mode, being able to run around a 10 mile or 20 mile uh, circumference track so that the uh, Soviets wouldn't know where they were, in which one or more MX missiles or transporters would stop at unknown locations in a multi-mile long racetrack. 
or a deceptive basing mode in which 500 MX missiles would de be deployed in 5,000 silos with dummy missiles in 4,500 of them, and so on. Ultimately, 50 MX missiles that cost a lot for the development were deployed in the very same Minuteman silos deemed to be so vulnerable that a new generation of ICBM missiles and bases were required that have now been, and these MX missiles have now been removed and destroyed. So uh, Minuteman vulnerability was replaced with MX vulnerability in spades. If three warheads on Minuteman were an attractive nuisance, 10 warheads on MX could hardly be resisted. Jason was tasked by Bill Perry, then Director of Defense uh, Research and Engineering in the Carter administration, to conduct a study of basing MX missiles on small submarines. Which would not need to deploy into the vast oceans because of the intercontinental range of the MX missile, and certainly not near the Soviet shores, where the first SLBM short-range missiles were deployed the uh, Polaris and, and then the Poseidon. Sid and I were the leaders of this Jason effort, and I recall that at a certain point, we had done what seemed to be a reasonable uh, classified study for the Defense Department, and then Sid prodded me, can't we do more? We could, and did an expanded study that resulted in the proposal to deploy two or 400 ton MX missiles individually encapsulated, lying horizontally alongside a submarine, or perhaps 500 or uh, perhaps 5, 000, 500 or 1,000 ton displacement compared with the 16,000 tons. <coughs> we took into account transients in the launch of the missile accurate navigation by hundreds of pseudolites on U.S. territory, broadcasting GPS-like signals, <coughs> because GPS would, of course, be attacked by the Soviet Union in a nuclear war. In typical SID collaboration mode, we arranged with the Draper Laboratory of Cambridge, Mass., to uh, send an observer to vet the to Draper anathema radio guidance Draper was all inertial, with the result, you can never be sure, that Draper began to use GPS for scoring its inertial navigation systems in test, uh, part of the way to relying on uh, GPS for the navigation of the missile itself. The Can't We Do More resulted in the additional effort to produce from the secret Jason report an unclassified publication in the MIT Technology Review, bringing the small undersea mobile sum system into public view and exposing it to criticism, both warranted and unwarranted. Perhaps its most famous moment was this New Yorker cartoon. Sid contacted the cartoonist and posted the original in his office at Slack. Here is the cartoon and a view of the 1981 Technology Review article. So the legend says, these two uh, men in the bar, ordinarily uh, I lean toward an, a land-based MX system, but when I have a few drinks, I lean toward those little submarines. So we persuaded at least one observer. So technology review, you know, unfortunately had artists involved <laughs> in the publication. And, uh, and so, uh, it results in the actual document being essentially unreadable. I have a, a better copy, but, but here, here is the text. Drag strip in Nevada and Utah have been proposed and so on. And uh, anyhow, here we go. So uh, lots of fun here. But it's a, it's a serious proposal. And a comment uh, by uh, James Fallows. So here are some sketches of the actual submarine. So the submarine itself is uh, 
Th this is the hull of a submarine, and here is missiles strapped alongside two or four missiles, and they're neutrally buoyant in their capsules. The uh, MX was going to be encapsulated anyhow. Neutrally buoyant in their capsules so that when you drop a, a missile in uh, the, the submarine doesn't have to uh, refare itself. And uh, the missile rises to the surface. It erects itself on the way up. It uh, blows its two ends uh, with explosive cutters. And uh, then the missile launches uh, right out of, the, out of the capsule. And uh, the capsule has an inflator so that it doesn't come down and strike the submarine <laughs> on the way down, but, but floats in the ocean. And you only expose uh, you know, one other or two or two, three other MX missiles to the location when you launch uh, one of them. Two more facets of the Drell Sega nu nuclear weapon safety reductions and uh, pot potential uh, elimination. In 1990, you know, good, I. In 1990, in response to concerns about the safety of U.S. nuclear weapons, SID was asked to form a congressional panel uh, to analyze the problem and uh, recommend solutions. This was not a, uh, a made-up problem. In fact, the analysis showed that some of the artillery, many artillery-fired nuclear weapons in Europe uh, were not, uh, were, not uh, were not safe against detonation of the explosive while in the gun barrel. And uh, these, these weapons were permanently uh, safed <laughs> and uh, removed from the inventory. In 19, so this was no easy tax, task in such a highly classified and sensitive area. And to do a proper job, Sid recruited fellow physicist Charles Towns and uh, Johnny Foster. Uh, Johnny was former director of the Lawrence Livermore uh, Weapon Laboratory, the former director of defense research and engineering, and is a highly respected and vigorous participant in many national security activities. Sid also had the good sense to recruit Bob Purifoy, who had recently retired from Sandia National Laboratories, which provides the arming, fusing, and firing system for U.S. nuclear weapons and much of the engineering of the nuclear weapon itself. Purifoy provided technical support and was keeper of a mine of unclassified technical information with which he was intimately familiar. He died about a year ago. He was a major contributor to U.S. nuclear security. Here I present several of the slides illustrating uh, the January uh, 2018 lecture by Raymond Jeanlo at Slack, recounting the Drell Towns Foster Nuclear Weapon Safety Study. And so uh, it's just the cover of the study from the 101st Congress, uh, December 1990. The panel on nuclear weapon safety, Sidney Drell, John Foster, Charles Towns. And uh, here's some of the content. So specifically, safety, security, and use control should be treated together because of their critical importance and their interdependence. Use control uh, refers, for instance, to the permissive action link, which was introduced uh, first with the 7,000 nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons that the uh, the Kennedy-Johnson administration deployed to, uh, to Europe. These were, many of them, uh, aircraft-delivered uh, bombs. They were on German aircraft piloted by German pilots, and the use control consisted of a uh, rifleman at the end of the runway whose job it was to shoot the airplane <laughs> if it was taking off without authorization with the U.S. nuclear weapon. <laughs> Technically, one could do better. And so uh, we, we introduced 
that is, the White House facilitated, the weapons establishment had developed an electromechanical combination lock built into the nuclear weapon itself that could be operated from outside. And of course, now we have much more sophisticated things. Beyond the very important content and conclusions of the study, there was a big legacy within the Jason group in the relationship of uh, trust and mutual respect created by the Drell Towns Foster panel with the US nuclear weapon laboratories, Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia. This stood the nation and Jason in good stead in continuing to maintain nuclear weapons reliable and safe despite the cessation of nuclear explosion testing in 1992 and helped lay the basis for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT, signed in 1995 and never ratified by the United States or China, has been ratified by, uh, by Russia. Sid spearheaded Jason work with uh, the White House and the DOE and DOD and the creation of the National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA, within DOE. Although his goal was a much more nearly autonomous National Nuclear Security Administration than turned out to be the case. Sid led, led the charge within Jason in helping to define the science-based stockpile stewardship program and to put reality beyond that name. Other than uh, over the years, you know, from 1994 to the present, more than a quarter century since the cessation of nuclear testing in 1992. Jason's work and that of his colleagues in the labs, Sid's work and that of his colleagues in the labs and in Washington has led to a better understanding of the US nuclear weapon stockpile than we ever had before or could have had with reliance on nuclear explosion testing. Raymond Jeanlo provided insight on Sid's work in arms control and nuclear weapons at the SLAC Memorial for Sid Drell, to which I referred, <clears throat> from which I uh, use these slides by permission. <coughs> so here are the covers of two uh, Jason reports that you can find on the web, Stewardship of U.S. Nuclear Weapons Objective provide technical basis for U.S. adopting comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, the CTBT. <coughs> so one of these is the 94, JSR 94, 345, and the second nuclear testing summary and conclusions on the right, 95, summer study of 1995. The CTBT helped remove a considerable spur to proliferation of nuclear weapons and a path to the refinement of nuclear weapons and to the extension of fission weapons to the more economical and far more powerful thermonuclear weapons. But Sid was not slow to realize that these accomplishments alone would not suffice, but that active arms control and reductions and even the elimination of nuclear weapons were goals to be prized. His deep involvement with Andrei Sakharov in advocacy of human rights and arms control and Sid's continued search for levers to achieve these aims encouraged his involvement in organizing the Gang of Four, George Schultz, Sam Nunn, William Perry, and Henry Kissinger, and in creating its initial focus on Reykjavik Revisited. Reykjavik was the Gorbachev-Reagan summit in 1986. So on the 20th anniversary, uh, so in uh, 2006, at their meeting in uh, 1986 where President Reagan hoped to eliminate fast flyers, that is, <coughs> nuclear-armed ICBMs, and uh, legitimize his uh, strategic defense initiative, after all, who could object to it if there weren't any ICBMs to be countered, uh, USSR General Secretary Gorbachev uh, countered with the elimination of all nuclear weapons worldwide. Gorbachev's insistence on confining SDI research to the laboratory and the US team's studied lack of imagination that this might be a space-based laboratory killed the, this improbable initiative because uh, President Reagan uh, was <clears throat> persuaded 
that uh, he should not give up the strategic defense initiative that he had begun. So Sid and the Gang of Four revived this uh, proposal for elimination of nuclear weapons in 2006 and have been working on it since, but especially on the control and the uh, reduction of nuclear weapons. I had dinner actually last night with Sam Nunn in New York. As in his uh, physics, Sidrell has left an admirable legacy of uh, conduct and, and uh, substance that we should try our best to emulate. And so I'm ready to hear comments and answer questions. I've got a lot of answers. <laughs> There's a microphone. Good, thank you. So we've seen the importance of, of people uh, who work both inside and outside the government are able to uh, provide, uh, uh, to contribute to the, uh, the public debate. Um, I mean, what is unique about working in this area as opposed to working in lots of other policy areas like climate and energy is that most of the information is classified. Some correctly, some not so much. Um, and the only way, uh, you know, for democracy to actually work is if there is the ability for people to understand and take part in, in, uh, in decisions or in, at least in uh, discussions about these things. Um, and so there are many, many, many scientists working on these issues in the labs, uh, in the D Department of Defense. There are about two dozen outside the government working at either... Uh, non-profits uh, like myself, universities like Frank, uh, some think tanks, and um, that's not a very big cadre, and they are aging. They're aging. Um, so I guess, Dick, I'd like you to say something about that. Well, we need a lot more people outside, and, but we need people actually to read, even though people don't work in this area. They should have an informed view. And so I, that's why I write these things and put them into the Garwin archive. And uh, so, so that's the Garwin archive. Oh, sorry about that. and have uh, extensive references. And that's why we, we, we do such things in physics, so that people can check on the credibility of your asserted results. So I refer to the National Academy uh, study of 2012, uh, Making Sense of Missile Defense, which provides a lot of good information. Uh, I don't think that the system that they propose there, doubling the size of the very large ballistic missile defense radars that are deployed, a you know, number of them over the world, will do the job either because they don't have a credible means of discriminating. And uh, lots of other uh, references there uh, to boost phase intercept and uh, other papers. And a lot of real nuclear weapons information that's provided, including uh, RDD-8, the Restricted Data Declassification Series uh, number eight, of, I think most recently of, I don't know, 10 years ago or whatever, which tells you in some things that have been formally declassified. So people ought to realize that there's an enormous threat to human life, our lives, and civilization in the world. Not only nuclear weapons, but cyber attack and whatnot. In fact, on May 1st, 2000. 18, I guess, I, I gave a talk at the Academy, brief talk, half an hour, about the five chief, uh, uh, chief strategic threats in the world. Okay, another question. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Dick, thanks very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, both the first part 
on ballistic missile defense and uh, the uh, reminiscences and summary of the wonderful contributions of Sid Drell. I'm Joel Premack. I'm the chair of the Forum on Physics and Society now, and I was Sid's graduate student from 1966 to 1970. And I was very much aware that Sid was spending a lot of his time on these issues because uh, he was traveling to Washington at least once every week, and his office was very heavily soundproofed because, among other things, Sid's great big booming voice yeah. couldn't, <clears throat> should not be heard outside his office when he was having all these classified conversations. But I wanted to add that Sid, in addition to all the things you mentioned, was a wonderful inspiration that it was possible to be a good scientist and also work on public policy. And I tried to uh, follow, not in the classified stuff that Sid did, but in every other way. Uh, and so uh, I helped to start the Forum on Physics and Society, the Congressional Science and Technology Fellowship Program, and many other things. Uh, and I regarded this as being the sort of thing that somebody trained by Sid ought to do. Uh, another one of Sid's graduate students is right here, uh, Bob Jaffe, and Bob also has made such contributions. So Sid was important in many ways, uh, including, of course, the things that Dick mentioned, but also in his impact on the science and also the public policy work of uh, his many students and other people who came in contact with Sid. So I just wanted to, to add that. Oh, thank you, Joel. And in fact, Bob Jaffe and, and uh Raymond Jarnlo uh, published the National Academy uh, Memorial uh, Biographical Memoir uh, of Sid Drell, which, is, which I advise reading in this document. I don't know whether you caught it in the text. Yeah, uh, please. So I have a question concerning gaps and stewardship of scientific information. So you had mentioned that formation of the Jasons was identified as a need by Sid to address a gap in technical knowledge in the defensive I guess, decision-making bodies of the government. Um, the question concerns actually the disparity in, say, service lifetimes of highly technical, say, weapons or defensive platforms beyond the lifetime of the researchers that are involved in that field. And that could either be due to funding cuts of that research area and then a dispersion of those scientists or actually the fact that the lifetime of those platforms is longer than the scientists themselves. And I was wondering if there's been any uh, look into how to preserve knowledge in those very highly technical areas that then inform very important geopolitical or uh, policy-based decision making. Well, first, a minor correction. It was, you know, in 1960, uh, well, In 1960, we didn't, didn't count ourselves among the senior scientists. So the senior scientists maybe were Charlie Towns and uh, certainly uh, Eugene Wigner and uh, people like that. So they felt this need. And uh, we, of course, I, I was on the President of Science Advisory Committee and close to it. Sid wasn't for several years more. And we tried in the panels of the President of Science Advisory, of PSAC, to do technical work and to bring in people who were unfamiliar with the field together with the gray beards with uh, wartime experience. But it wasn't a sufficiently deep and long immersion and uh, it, it couldn't do real work. And so that was the, so for several years before 1960, this need had been recognized and it was only when Charlie Towns uh, took leave from Columbia, I guess, to go to the Institute for Defense analyses as vice president that he managed to hit upon a solution. So the question, <clears throat> if the weapons last longer than the scientists who build them, uh, you know, who, who's the custodian of the knowledge? Well, this did come up, of course, in the 1990s uh, with the cessation of nuclear testing. And that's one of the reasons for testing, is to demonstrate that you can still build and, uh, nuclear weapons and they work. And it was a major concern about the abandonment of testing. So one of the programs in, uh, initiated was a program of archiving knowledge, interviews with the senior weapon designers. And of course, there's a lot of art in, in nuclear weapons as well. 
and that's not so well documented. And uh, even when a person retires or, or dies, as you say, so it's a problem, and you have to try to understand these things, and that's why it's difficult to change some innocuous part of a nuclear weapon and count on its continuing to work. So we do have some, uh, let's see, uh, test, joint test, joint JT, joint test assemblies, I guess. So the weapon has its plutonium removed, but everything else is uh, very similar to, to that in the, reg in the normal weapon. And uh, we have had some serious surprises uh, when the uh, weapons have been launched on, on ballistic missiles and re-enter and were exploded with telemetry uh, within the atmosphere, but with, of course, no nuclear yield <coughs> or dropped as bombs on the ground. And, you know, things break. And uh, keeping the, the same weapon, the same weapon for a long time, if you have an old house, you look at the insulation on the old wires and it gets hard and it will fracture and vibration and whatnot. And so some of these things really do need to be renewed. But, you know, we've been at this for a long time and I've published many papers like atoms don't age. And if you do have the design and you can remake the thing to within the range of variability of the original fabrication, uh, you ought to be pretty sure. But you should avoid you know, improvements for improvement's sake. And I, I have many examples of, in the non-nuclear field where that goes wrong. Thank you. Yeah, you're